Olympic sniper turned battleship commander Willis Ching Lee by the fat electrician. This man is the greatest gunslinger of all time, and you've probably never even heard of him. Probably not, actually. Today, we're talking about Willis Augustus Lee, a.k.a. Cheng Lee. This man won five Olympic gold medals in a single year for shooting, then went on to become a battleship commander and used the same principles that he learned at long-range precision shooting and nice. applied them to the massive 16-inch guns on the USS Washington to become the most successful battleship commander ever, and he did all of it with myopia. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video nice. is brought to you by Delete Me. <laughs> oh, Nicholas, I thought you would never ask. Oh, no. Wait, Is that a real wait. MP5? No joke. Chat can tell you we were literally talking about the MP5 and the Zenith literally right before this. This is so spooky. It's it's so funny to me. Come and find out. Nice. I, uh, uh, nice. I gotta, I gotta go. I'll be right back. He's okay. got to go real quick. Here we go real quick. <laughs> The irony that I am looking at a, Sorry a Zenith like MP5. Saying, this video is brought to you by Delete Me. All right, here's the deal. It's super straightforward. You give Delete Me money, they turn around and they make sure the data brokers on the internet aren't selling your personal information because if Delete Me submits an opt out request, these data brokers are legally required to take that information down and quit selling it. The problem is there's hundreds of data brokers and they make it unnecessarily difficult to submit these opt out requests. So Delete mm -hmm. Me does all of that for you. And yes, most of these data brokers more than likely have your information because we've all signed up for a free trial or we've all downloaded a free app. And whenever you click that little check mark that says I agree to these terms of service inside of those terms of service it usually says hey our app or our service isn't actually free and the way we make money is we use this to harvest all of your data and then we turn around and sell that data on the internet and that's how we make money if so yep. facto our app or our service isn't free we've just turned you into the product and now we're gonna sell you I think we can all agree that's not <laughs> yeah. cool but that's no. the unfortunate fact of life nothing is actually free but here's the good news you sign up for delete me you use the discount code electrician it's gonna save you 20 percent you're gonna end up paying like six dollars a month to get all your information deleted off the internet and all that free shit that you've already enjoyed while it might not actually be free delete me can make sure it only costs you like six dollars a month instead of having all your personal information sold on the internet so go check them out all of that link and discount code down below let's get back to the video on i will say before moving forward actually on this point because there's a number of places around me that are oh hey get a free burger get a free sandwich with this app right i never take advantage of those because i know in that terms and conditions it is effectively i am giving you my information because i have to sign up with like you know name phone number etc i have to sign up for that and give a certain amount of information to get and free burger right and free product right i don't see it as a relevant exchange in my personal opinion just something to think about not saying to not use certain apps not saying to use certain things just things to think about right why are they offering you a free burger why are they offering you a free pastrami sandwich why are they offering you a free cup of ice cream right just think about it. Today's episode of Badasses with Bad Eyesight, Ching Lee, born in a small town in Kentucky in 1888. His father was a local judge and had a lifetime passion for shooting, a love for shooting that he would pass on to his son, Lee Jr. By the time Lee was 10 years old, he was such a good shot that he could shoot a bird in flight with his 22. Because of that, he became his small local town's pest exterminator. Anytime anybody had any rodent or any type of pest that they wanted gotten rid of, they would call the young Ching Lee and he would take care of it That's for them. That's so cool. In addition to his passion for shooting, he also thoroughly enjoyed blowing shit up for fun because, yeah. well, there's not a whole lot to do in Kentucky in the early 1900s and America. Yeah. Oh, there is poop on everything. Unfortunately nice. for Lee, this would bring about a lifetime full of problems because one day him and his brother decided to fill a coffee can full of black powder, have a line of black powder leading away from the can so that they could light it safely. They lit it. The fire went all the way down the line of black powder into the can and nothing happened. So uh -huh. they waited and then nothing continued to happen. So finally, Willis Lee approached the can, looked at it, got close, opened it up, and then it blew up in his face, no. giving him severe burns all over his face and no. eyes. Due to the severity of the burns, it was believed in the days immediately following the accident that Lee would be blind for the rest of his life. Fortunately, he would regain a significant amount of his eyesight. However, his eyes were permanently damaged and he would have to wear thick glasses for the rest of his life. I'm going to be honest. Black powder spooks me. I uh, go to a very specific range in uh, Idaho. It's actually just outside of Boise. I do have to travel a little bit to it, but uh, I do like going to this outdoor range. It's actually very fun to go there for me. Uh, actually, I'm not first name based, but I'm on very good terms with the range staff. They're excellent uh, range. They have a specific counter for black powder, like uh, how, you know, it's like, hey, you know, you got two minutes to wrap up what you're doing, right? Finish out your magazine, put your chamber flags in, etc. Uh, 
they have like double that time. So about if it's a two minute warning, like four minute warning for black powder, black powder spooks me because like that stuff is magic. Kind of like I got this stupid little canister today to put in my safe. It's like, it's like a, a, a non-rechargeable dehumidifier kind of thing you throw in the oven to get rid of the moisture. This th- this thing is magic. I, it, it, it perplexes my, my small VTuber brain. <laughs> But like black powder is one of those that I I would I don't want to touch it with a ten foot pole. I really don't. I would have to have somebody instruct me in the ways of black powder because so much can go wrong. Man, it's uh I, I hear it's a time though. I hear it is very much a time. So obviously the young Ching Li was a pretty rambunctious kid, and that translated over into the classroom as well, because he is the classic case of the kid that's so smart that school doesn't interest him or keep him stimulated. So yeah. he has a bad habit of giving off tasks and doing things he shouldn't be doing. Uh mainly he's Me. a prankster <laughs> and a humongous smart ass. For example, when he was twelve years old, he was already chewing tobacco. And the nice. teacher would always Not confiscate me. his pouch of tobacco, walk it across the schoolhouse, and throw it into the wood burning furnace in the corner. Finally, nice. Lee got sick of the teacher burning up all his tobacco, so he went home, emptied tobacco out of the tobacco pouch, filled it full of black powder, oh, and stuffed no. that in his pocket and waited to go to school the next day. See, these are, these are the, the kids that we label as problem kids. Like, do, do you know how... <laughs> I can't condone this behavior. I, I don't think I can legally say to do this, obviously. But oh my god, is that not next level, though? That is the... The bully bullying someone's kid, and the, and they know that the bully's gonna take their cupcake, so they lace it with like like laxatives, and then you, <laughs> and then the bully just, God. that is some next level. Like get that man <laughs> in a program, like an actual like, hey, here's your accelerated education program to do something. He will do well. Day. Sure enough, teacher confiscates the pouch of black powder, walks it over to the furnace, throws it in, blows up the entire wood furnace. <laughs> And then, in true smart-ass fashion, when Lee got in trouble for it, he said, look, this isn't my fault. You took no. my shit, didn't ask me what it was, and then threw it into fire. That's 100% on you. He's on another not wrong. occasion, the teacher had the audacity to send Lee home because his shoes weren't shined enough. So, he went home, shined his shoes, stuck paper sacks over his shoes, and tied them up top with a rope. He then walked to school and refused to take the paper bags off because he didn't want his shoes to become unshined and not be within the school's dress code. With the uh-huh. culmination of all these things, Lee's father realizes that he needs to get his son into the military as soon as possible so he has some way to positively channel all of this energy, otherwise he's going to end up in jail or worse. So yeah. being that he was already a judge, he pulled some strings, gets his kid into Annapolis at the age of 16. Annapolis is where he would get his lifelong nickname of Ching. Originally it was a different C word that's actually a racial slur. Apparently yeah. it changed to Ching over time just because it was easier to say. Now they didn't yeah. give him that name because he is Asian. He's a white dude from Kentucky. However, he does kind of look like he could be Asian, he wears round, thick glasses, his last name is Lee, and he is a huge Asian history nerd. Sometimes even going as far as signing his signature in Chinese symbols. What I'm trying to tell you is if this were modern times, this dude would definitely be watching anime. I mean, to be fair, I have definitely signed off stuff in Katakana. I have absolutely done that. N- no shame. <laughs> Sometimes, Actually, funny fact, I've, I've talked about this on stream before in some capacity. I uh, was in charge of a tiny satellite kitchen in the kitchen I worked with. It was a two kind of kitchen system, right? There was a little satellite kitchen to ease the burden off the big kitchen. It was just expedited stuff. I made a whole graph and chart of like, I think it was two, three pages front and back. And I did most of it in Japanese. <laughs> I think my chef kept it and showed it to another chef. And it's just like, yeah, this guy, this kid, right? <laughs> Kip, Kip, uh, Kip relates to some of the story. <laughs> Karat, you've never kissed someone? Huh? No, of course not. Why? You're married and have children. Yeah, duh, but what's that have to do with kissing? Mood. Now, for his entire four years at Annapolis, he is thoroughly unamused with coursework. He pretty much speeds through it as fast as humanly possible so he can get back to studying things that he likes and going out and shooting guns. Now, no. because of this, he does join the Navy shooting team, and his senior year, he gets an opportunity to go represent the Navy in a huge national competition put on by the National Rifle Association. At this competition, there is a rifle competition and a pistol competition. Lee has been selected to participate in the rifle competition. Now, this mm-hmm. rifle competition is a huge deal. There are 684 people there competing, and they are all qualified to be there. Regardless, Ching Lee ends up winning first place, nice. earning the gold medal by getting a bullseye at a thousand yard target, and he wins the entire thing before lunch. Not really nice. having anything else to do for the rest of the day. He's like, fuck it. I guess I'll go do the pistol competition now, too, <laughs> just for funsies. Fast forward about 80% of the way through this pistol competition and Ching Lee is winning and he wasn't
wasn't even there to compete in the pistol oh competition. Oh my god! And as he's shooting different targets, his pistol blows up in his hand because one of the rounds that he had had too much black powder in it Aww. from the factory. It blew up his gun and messed up his hand. Not giving a shit, turns around to his buddies watching, somebody throw me a pistol. He grabs it, <laughs> catches it with his left hand, finishes the round with his wow. non-dominant hand, and goes on to win the pistol competition as well, earning two gold medals, being the only American to do it. So after that- I mean, to be fair, like, at that point, just, no, you, you just win. Like, on just sheer badass points alone, you just win. Like, I'm <laughs> just imagining. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> you're using your competition 1911 or 2011 round causes it to blow up or something like that. Just go catastrophic. Turn to your buddy. Hey, give me your, give me your 1911 throws you like a Springfield 1911, uh, or even a llama 19, whatever they have. Right. <laughs> something that, you know, just like already, I can tell you from SCA and stuff like that. It is hard to pick up another. So how in movies, they just pick up another sword and they start fighting. That is not how that works. Every sword is weighted different. There are different styles of swords. Some are just balanced differently. There is a whole thing that goes into that. So naturally going into firearms, right? You may be used to your 1911, but your buddy has a say Springfield 1911. It is going to feel completely different. <laughs> you know, until you get used to it, just, Hey, toss me that already accounts for and accommodates for the differences between the firearm platforms and proceeds to win. Dude, dude just wins. Like, that, that straight W, just, I know all of you came here to compete, that man just won. Like, <laughs> God. This is next level to the umpteenth degree. He goes back to Annapolis. He's got both of his gold medals. He's basically the Kevin Gates of gold medals, if you will. And it's time to graduate. Now, bad news. He has to take a physical first. And after going all the way through Annapolis schooling, finishing the program, and just winning two gold medals in a national shooting competition, yeah. they decide you're not qualified to actually join the Navy because, well, your vision's not good enough, <laughs> despite the fact that you just scored a bullseye at a thousand <laughs> yards last week. So at this point, Ching Lee does exactly what every other badass with bad eyesight would do, and he cheats on that fucking eye exam and makes his way into the Navy. I feel I feel like at this point, where, where you have some uh, some people in the military right now who are doing eye exams and physicals and stuff, <laughs> I feel like they're getting a kick out of these videos. <laughs> Yes. Now, as an officer in training, he gets shuffled around to a bunch of different ships to get a bunch of different experiences, figure out what he likes doing, figure out what he's good at, get him exposed to everything. That's how this is supposed to go. During that time, he actually publishes his first ever article, and it's about the proper way of shooting a pistol. Nice. It's published in the Naval Magazine, and he actually signs his signature at the bottom with a Chinese symbol again. Nice. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I like the quote that he actually put in this magazine, and that was, focus on acquiring accuracy before you try to acquire speed, which which is eerily similar to the famous quote from also famous gunslinger Wyatt Earp, fast is fine, but accuracy is final. You got to learn how to be slow in a hurry. My I love this. I absolutely love this because it figure out your form, get your accuracy and precision down. Then you can focus on being fast. It does you absolutely no good just to bam, 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 bam. If you're not hitting stuff, right? <laughs> if you're not hitting the target, 15, 20, 30 feet in front of you, what does it matter if you can fight, you empty a magazine in, you know, five seconds, right? <laughs> cool. You just, you just burnt all of that money. <laughs> imagine if you were like, we're not even talking like nine, but imagine you have like 50 BMG or something like that. You're like, yeah, I could put this entire magazine down range in three seconds flat. Okay. But did you hit the thing, right? Which, what is cooler, right? Rapid firing 50 BMG or taking your time and bullseyeing everything with that 50 bmg i think we can all pretty much agree yeah if this dude can bullseye every single round of that magazine cool go for i'm oddly fixated on the barrett 50 cal i saw one recently i'm just like god it's i don't have the credit score to even touch that let's put it that way <laughs> i have very good credit score don't get me wrong but like man that is a hefty chunk of change right there point being game recognize game they're both onto something and you should probably write that shit down now the young lee finally makes his way onto the uss new hampshire and that is when the occupation of veracruz happens all right super brief oversimplified version of what's happening right now it is 1914 and mexico is having a revolution and the new mexican government is not a huge fan of the united states of america because of that the tempico affair ends up happening which mm -hmm. is the mexican government 
government basically captures and detains a bunch of American sailors for a little while. It's a big diplomatic nightmare between yeah. Mexico and the United States. Because of that, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, decides that he's going to put an embargo on Mexico and he's not going to let any guns into the country because he's scared that they're going to use them against America. And in April of 1914, Mexico gets a huge shipment of firearms despite the embargo. If so facto, Woodrow Wilson sends in the Navy and the Marines to go get those weapons back. Now, bear in mind, this is 1914. There's no Higgins boats. There's no amphibious landing vehicles. Nobody's doing D-Day type shit. Mm -hmm. So there's literally just a bunch of Navy and Marine dudes getting driven ashore in whaling <laughs> boats, hopping out and going to find these guns, I Hell guess, because yeah. the president said so. <laughs> so since, you know, America's basically invading Mexico, some of the Mexicans get pretty pissed off, obviously. So they start shooting at the Americans, which, you know, not super happy about it, but yeah. I understand the sentiment. <laughs> I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. Now, unfortunately for them, the downside of shooting at people is they're probably going to shoot back, you know, assuming they have guns, which... America always does. Now, yeah. somewhere along the line, Lee's entire unit gets pinned down by these enemy snipers that are up on top of roofs and inside of windows and high buildings, basically shooting at guys lower on the ground, and nobody's able to shoot these guys back, and everybody's just pinned down where they're at. So, Lee remembering like, oh shit, I'm the main character with bad eyesight, I got this, grabs his gun and just walks out in the middle of the street corner in broad fucking daylight uh -huh. with no cover whatsoever, and he just sits there with his gun. Sure enough, after a couple of seconds, somebody finally shoots at him, but they miss, and now <laughs> Lee saw where they're at, and He's Lee not shoots back, and remember, Ching Lee doesn't miss, and then yeah. he continues to sit there, and somebody <laughs> shoots at him, and they miss, and- This is psychological warfare at its finest. I'm here. You're come on, try me. Everyone. What is he doing? He he's just there. Do 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 we do we do this? Do we not? Is there what do we do? Someone takes a pot shot. I I see where you're at. Counter snipe. <laughs> Someone else misses. Counter snipe. Just this man is a laser and I love it. Lee shoots back and Lee don't miss. And this goes on for a while, pretty much until they quit shooting at Lee, presumably because there was none of them left. Yeah. When asked about this later in life, the only thing Lee would say was, quote, yeah, I think I got a couple of them. Yeah. Of all the men that were there and actually saw it, many of them had a much less modest version of this story to tell, with some of them claiming as many as 12 men were dispatched by Lee, all yeah. the while he was giving them the first chance to shoot at him. Then uh -huh. later during this Veracruz side quest, Lee is also credited again with saving a man's life by running through gunfire to get him and provide medical attention. The man is literally Clint Eastwood, except it's 1914 and he's real. I do want to say that it is... So I'm a very huge fan of the chad move there's the the thing when uh in boxing i think it is specifically where someone can just be hitting you you're taking all these hits and then after they're done hitting you you go all right my turn the the absolute just shift in mood with that sentiment alone it, it kind of reminds me of this actually it's it's such a shift of just like <laughs> Yeah, you may be good, you may be trying, but I'm just better. It, it is such a power play. Oh, you're gonna look awfully silly with that knife sticking up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> you still here? Uh, no. Now, because of the bravery he displayed at Veracruz, he's put up for promotion by his leadership, and he gets denied because his vision is too bad. And at this point, his entire chain of command is basically writing letters of recommendation, essentially yelling at the entire yeah. medical bureaucratic side of the Navy that's denying him that they're insane because this guy's awesome. Seriously. He Did they actually get better at this, though? Like, has, has the military gotten better at this? I know that there's allegedly been some discussion in lowering certain standards fitness standards i do know mandatory fun day another awesome youtuber by the way uh youtuber tiktok creator mandatory fun day has gone over some of that uh i i don't really have a leg to stand on to really discuss the subject i feel like this would have had to get better after a certain point right like when you are turning down very good and competent and skilled men on just whatever arbitrary metrics they're using to determine his eyesight and his skill level, right? Or his proficiency, right? I don't, this feels like this would be addressed at some point. I would hope it would at, the, at some he point. Like 20 letters of recommendation for high ranking officers, including the skipper of his current vessel, the USS New Hampshire. And in that letter, he says something along the lines of, I saw Lee crumple a man from 800 yards with iron sights at Veracruz 
he can see <laughs> just fine. So his promotion gets taken into consideration for an extended period of time, and because of that, he gets taken off sea duty and gets sent basically to the middle of the country, and he is working for the U.S. Navy, going to different factories and figuring out what these factories need to do to be able to better manufacture stuff for mm -hmm. the U.S. Navy. During this time, he meets his wife in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Then America enters World War One, and he gets sent over to Europe, although he does not get attached to a combat vessel, so he never actually sees combat. After World mm -hmm. War One, Lee would go on to compete in the 1920 Olympics, where he would actually win seven medals, five gold, nice. one silver, one bronze, which would turn out to be the record for the most medals won by any one person at any one Olympic Games, and that record would stand until 1980. Okay, just so we're on the same page, dude just won five gold Olympic medals for sharpshooting, and he's having trouble getting promoted because he has bad eyesight. Anyways, for the rest of the 1920s, Lee spends pretty much the entire time working on different destroyers, just working his way up the ranks, becoming a bigger and better leader. Now, about his style of leadership, everybody absolutely loves this guy that works with him because he has this way where he just teaches people what they need to do, and if mm -hmm. they're not good at it, he gets them good at it, and then he just lets them do their job. He doesn't try to micromanage them, he's not up everybody's ass, he just wants to get people where they need to be so they have the skills they need so that they can do their job, and then he goes and dicks off so he can go do target practice yeah. and build traps to kill rats because that was like his new hobby. That was seriously <laughs> what he was known for, building elaborate mouse traps on destroyers. He had ones that were like air guns rigged up to trip wires that would shoot rats, which is the most American shit I've ever heard of in my yeah, entire yeah, life. There was yeah. another one that was really popular where he had a little miniature guillotine that he had electrically <laughs> rigged up to a push button on his desk and all the boys would sit there and play a game when the rat would run across it, they would try to hit the button just in time to cut the rat in half. And then like whenever there was anything to shoot at from the ship, he had his own private stash of guns in his quarters and he would run out and there'd be these like glass balls from abandoned fishing nets that would be floating in the ocean and he'd run out and shoot at them from the deck and he'd invite the Marines to come out and shoot with him over the PA system. And he was actually out there teaching the Marines how to become better shots. Everybody absolutely loved this guy. Love this so that dude. goes on until about 1930 and then he finally makes his way back on battleships and heavy cruisers, at which point he gets absolutely obsessed with gunnery. He wants to shoot the big guns better than anybody ever has. He actually ends up writing a paper that later on got published talking about how battleships need to take into consideration the curvature of the earth when they're gathering targeting data, and he develops the calculations for the battleships to do that. He's yeah. literally teaching people how to treat a battleship the way a sniper treats a gun, and it's highly effective. Because after publishing that paper, another battleship commander actually took that data and started implementing it and his battleship won most accurate ship for the next three years in a row, and he said it was all due to Lee's calculations. Dave That's wild to consider. And this, there are certain markers that just hyper-intelligent people have. Just boredom with school, right? Like, one of the big ones, right? Having kind of that hyper-fixation. I wouldn't necessarily go as far to say as, you know, man is neurodivergent. Whether this man is neurodivergent or not isn't really, I don't know, doesn't really matter, nor is it a valid point of speculation in my opinion i think that it also could have some people look at it in a very weird way because <laughs> let's be real as somebody that has uh uh been uh self-admittant of my uh neuro spiciness if you will there are people that will automatically hear kip is neurodivergent neuro spicy and just be like just discredit everything i say regardless of how much it makes sense because 2024 am i right <laughs> But I mean, like, it comes down to this man is clearly hyper intelligent. He clearly knows what he wants to do. He clearly has his passion. He clearly, some might even call it a fixation. He knows what he, he knows his stuff. He is just like, he is the man that managers want to hire, that want everyone to be. You are hyper efficient. You are uh, able to do everything you need to. You are able to do the task and then some, right? But at the end of the day, he. <laughs> He has his passions for, like, he has the intelligence for the rat trap me uh, mechanics, right? He can make all of these and assemble all of these and have just all of these things. Dude is clearly hyper intelligent, but nah, we're just going to get stuck on, nah, bad eyesight, bro. Lamau. It's, it's so unfortunate. You're not catching on. Lee is actually treating his naval career the same way he treated his academic career. He's not interested in the normal coursework of like leading and micromanaging a bunch of sailors. He wants to get everybody where they need to be. He wants to get through his work as fast as he can so that he can go do stuff that interests him, like pioneering new ways to be accurate with gunnery. Because of this, he develops a reputation as a problem solver. So late 1930s, they send him over to Washington, D.C., and his orders are basically get everybody ready for war because we know it's coming. Okay, now this is probably the least coolest but most important part of the entire story. This uh -huh. man essentially gets sent to Washington, D.C. to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the United States Navy's biggest nemesis, the Bureau of Ordnance. 
What? You Who? Help you, Michael. Bitch, it's God. Michael. <laughs> You're very helpful, aren't you? You try to help everybody. What? Do you want to play another game? Okay, if you don't know, the I have never heard of them. This is going to be amazing. The Bureau of Ordnance is a bureaucratic nightmare that does nothing but slow down and halt any progress the U.S. Navy tries to make at literally anything ever. For example, if you remember like a month ago when I made oh, the USS no. Parchy video with loss and red ramage and he was shooting torpedoes at all these Japanese ships, but the torpedoes would hit and then not blow up because they were duds because it's a known fact that the Mark 14 torpedo fucking sucked and he complained to the chain of command and the chain of command told him, too bad, you just suck with torpedoes, the torpedoes are fine. That was the Bureau of Ordnance. Oh no. These are those guys. First off, if you haven't watched his video on that, you should definitely go watch his video on that. It's actually a really good video. Uh, for those curious as well, yes, there is a reaction up to it on this channel. But I do recommend you check out the original. So basically, the chain of command has sent Lee to Washington, D.C. to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys because they know that Lee doesn't have the time or the temperament to put up with their bureaucratic bullshit. Uh -huh. And they're absolutely correct because Willis Lee is about to turn into a wood chipper for red tape. So Lee what? shows up and he starts learning and finding out about all these fancy new toys the Navy has that are just being held up by bureaucratic nonsense. For example, I don't know, fucking radars. Lee, uh -huh. being the forward thinker that he is, he's like, you can put a screen in my office that tells me where the enemy is so that I can shoot them with my big ass guns without even having to see them. Yeah, put that on every fucking ship in the Navy. What's wrong with you? But don't worry, because the Bureau of <laughs> Ordnance and their infinite fucking wisdom doesn't seem to agree with Lee and they don't think they're going to be that big of a deal and they just want to put them on some ships and they don't want to waste all their money on radars because they're dumb. Who are these people? Like, how, how do you get in this position? Like, how do you get in this position to hold up any sort of progress? And I like to be fair, in fairness of impartiality, this is the the oh the first time I've heard of them, and just hearing that they're also behind that the the, the, the missiles, right? I'm sorry, torpedoes. I don't really have a good impression of them. I'm sure that uh, if someone from this Someone from this branch looks at this video. God help you. I don't know how you ended up here on YouTube, though. Sure, you're a lovely person. I, I have no reason to discredit you as a person. But oh my God, like, how do you end up in this position? I, I don't know. I'm also weird. I'm always, I don't like nepotism. I'm always for you should, you know, promote based on merit. Like, Willis Ching Lee, right? Dude's clearly competent at what he's doing. He can also back it up with multiple Olympic medals at what he's doing. Also, a paper that helped another battleship get the most uh, uh get the award for most accurate naval vessel, right? Clearly, he knows what he's talking about. So why are we not promoting him into these positions? And that's where Kip just fails to understand the world, or at least rejects the world <laughs> in certain capacities, because I can't stand, well, hey, you're my buddy. I need you here, right? Don't get me wrong. I have I have friends. I, I have people that I would absolutely trust with certain things. That being said, if it was between, say, I don't know, a uh, buddy with minimal time on his hands versus someone who is clearly a just absolute force of nature in their field and they have accolades to back it up. Hey, sorry, I got to go with this person though. Cause they know what they're doing and they can devote the time and have devoted the time prior. Right. I think that's incredibly fair. Right. If I have a friend who is a teacher versus a friend who, I don't know, sits at a game shop all day and I want to ask, Hey, I have a question in regards to writing a presentation, writing a paper, writing a video, right. Trying to teach this subject. Who do you think I'm going to talk to? I can talk to both of them equally fine, right? But which one is going to have more experience in the field? That should be what's looked at. That should be what's favored. But then again, <laughs> Kip and bureaucracy don't exactly mix. I, I don't like the game. <laughs> Um, apparently. But they know Lee's not going to take no for an answer, so they tell Lee that they can't get any more radars due to manufacturing shortages, to which Lee immediately goes, fine, then I'll buy them from Britain. Magically, nice. the Bureau of Ordnance found all the radars he could possibly <laughs> need. Imagine that. Okay, next order of business, American submarines. Their biggest weakness is having purified water because they can't purify water fast enough for how quickly they consume it because the crew needs water and the batteries in the submarines at this point in time mm -hmm. also eat a ton of water. Water. Luckily, there's a new EVAP system that's going to allow them to have way more purified water, and it's going to be great. Unfortunately, it's held up in bureaucratic red tape. Okay, like they're there. They're done. They've been manufactured. They're ready. 
but the government wants to run more tests on them, even though everybody in the Navy is like, no, they fucking work. We just, they're just not letting us use them. So Lee just walks in, issues the order to install them, and if anybody has a problem, they can blame him. So Lee's just <laughs> getting shit done. He's checking things off. Now, at this point in time, whenever you're doing a bunch of paperwork for the Navy, there's like a status box where you hit it with a rubber stamp to tell everybody how important this paper needs to get through the bureaucratic process. Now, there's three statuses. There's routine, priority and urgent obviously in that order urgent is like we need to get this done as quickly as possible now right. everything lee marked was urgent he didn't give a shit he needed his shit done right now because that's just the type of guy he is but yeah. unfortunately they were still just not getting it done fast enough to his liking so he's like fuck it i'm gonna get my own rubber stamp made that said frantic so then whenever <laughs> anybody got lee's documentation for the first time in their entire naval career there's a new word stamped there in red ink that sounds more important than urgent oh, so no. everybody's just like oh shit we're doing this first and then lee just how 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 much trouble would you be in today if you did that if you were in if you were in the navy <laughs> you fashioned your own rubber stamp it stamped official naval documents with this i i feel like the answer is how much trouble you get in is probably yes <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> oh i i have I have I have respect for this man. Don't get me wrong. The absolute cojones on this man. It, it, it gives me life. This is this is beautiful. This uses this to keep on powering through to get more and more <laughs> shit done. Next thing is to get a schoolhouse stood up for the US Navy that teaches sailors how to read aerial reconnaissance pictures because that's gonna be huge in an upcoming war because they're gonna need pictures to show where all the reefs and all the atolls are and they're gonna uh -huh. have to be able to read those pictures accurately to get proper intel. So first the chain of command is like, okay, well, we'll get Hollywood involved. They know things about like cameras and shit. That's yeah. right answer right and Lee and a couple of other officers that actually have good ideas are like uh no why don't we just go over to britain and ask them to help us we'll send a couple of guys over get them trained by them because they already do this really well and we're yeah. on the same team it would be great why wouldn't you do that we can share information with them and vice versa and we all get better together hooray at which because point bureaucracy? the u.s naval research laboratory is like no absolutely not because the united states navy is way better than the british navy and we know that because we conducted a study that we verified ourselves <laughs> Yeah. Okay, now in <laughs> What was the meme? I think it was something about like uh was it like Halo 3 rated 5 out of 5 by Microsoft and the meme is just like wiping their glasses just like huh? <laughs> I I don't know about that one, Captain. Like <laughs> What? <laughs> You can't verify it yourself, right? That doesn't that doesn't make sense. That's, that's not how that works. See, I say that's not how this works, but at the same time, this is actually how this works. I I can't stand bureaucracy. I think we can all agree that's dumb, and that is why Lee ended up sending a guy over there anyways for any bullshit ass excuse that he yeah. could find, and then ended up extending his orders every time they ran short. So he was just over there soaking up as much information and training as humanly possible, and that guy would actually come back and found the Naval School for being able to read aerial photography. Okay, so that's Ooh. going on. Lee just keeps charging, tackling more issues. Next thing on the docket, the Mark 53, aka the Proximity Fuse. Okay, I cannot stress to you how important this one actually is. This is one of the most important developments in World War II is the proximity fuse. Okay, it's basically the new type of anti-aircraft ammunition. Your only options prior to this were like shooting basically birdshot up at planes and hoping you fucking hit them. Shooting okay. 50 cows up at planes hoping you hit them. Literally trying to hit a plane with a bullet. Or yeah. you had mechanically timed ammunition where you were shooting it and it had a timer and then it would blow up in midair and you're just hoping that a plane happens to cross at that exact moment and everything works out. You're basically playing the lottery with all of those until the Mark 50 53 proximity fuse. I would like to add option four. You eject from your plane, pull out your 1911, and actually score the W. <laughs> Which Fat Electrician also has a video up on that if you are interested. Yes, he does. Came out. Okay, it's a little more complicated than this, but it basically has its own tiny little miniature Doppler radar inside mm -hmm. of it. And when it's flying through the air, that Doppler radar is emitting signals and it's reading anything bouncing back at it. And once something gets close to this ammunition, it starts sending the signals back. And when it gets close enough and those mm -hmm. signals come back frequently enough, it knows that it's near a plane in midair and it mm -hmm. just blows up on its own when it gets near enough 
to the plane. Okay, right. it's the first type of ammunition that actually knows where the plane is and blows up at the right fucking time. It's a big deal. So naturally, huge, the Bureau of Ordnance huge, is like, wow, this thing's incredible. This is a total game changer. We're going to go ahead and get in the way for no fucking reason. You want to know what they say? I'm going to tell you. They say that you're not going to be allowed to use that new ammunition until it has a 100% reliability rating. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say that again, but slower. The Bureau of Ordnance said that you're not allowed to use this new ammunition until it is a hundred percent reliable. Okay, do you understand how fucking stupid that is? You know what's a you know what? That, that's incredibly stupid. Well, you can't sell your hand sanitizer or hand soap unless it kills a hundred percent of germs. Why do you think they say 99.9, 99.99% of germs? That is absolutely asinine. Yes, at a time of war too, someone in chat mentioned. No, absolutely. That is asinine. Like, okay, there, there are certain things. What was it? The uh, the code-breaking machine for uh, the funny uh, German Reich, right? The funny... I can't remember what it was called, but the uh, the box that they used to code-break their stuff. Situations, discoveries like that, I can understand why you don't use... You only use it in specific circumstances because to break those codes to thwart everything, you would lose any advantage you have because that was a mission based on secrecy. Enigma Cipher, thank you. That was based on secrecy. That was different. Holding something like this with a high effective rate, not 100, right? But say, say let's just, let's just, you know, spitball, say 85%, 80% plus, right? I think anyone is just like, yeah, you're telling me 80% of the time this this takes care of planes? Okay, what, <laughs> what are the other options? We just spitball it from the ground, right? Like, that is a decision that costs lives. That is why I would not be any sort of helpful in a military setting in any sort of i'm a civilian i'm not i'm not military i'm not military co contract i am just a plain civilian i would not do good in an environment like this because i would absolutely look at the chain of command or the bureaus uh, bureaucrats that are doing this holding out discoveries like this costing pe people their lives and look at this and just be like you are an absolute imbecile <laughs> and then probably i'd be uh i'd be shoved in the little box that i have to stay in for the next 48 hours <laughs> I'd be mopping up rain consistently. You, Kip in a military setting would not do good. <laughs> 100% reliable. Nothing. Nothing is 100% reliable. Fucking condoms don't even have 100% no, reliability. No. Right? You want to get technical? Fucking abstinence isn't even 100% reliable because Jesus was a thing. Okay? I'm pregnant. Yeah. From my finger? No, you don't understand. God has blessed me with his child. You banged Kevin God from South Nazareth? You want to know how smart and forward-thinking Ching Lee is? It's like 1939, and he already knew that the future of naval warfare was going to be all about the carriers, and he's 100% right, but he knew at this point in time, okay, because they came and they wanted to build this class of American heavy cruisers. It was going to be the Alaska class. They made two of them, but they wanted to make like fucking 10 of them. And Lee came in and was like, no, those are dumb. You shouldn't have made the first two. Take all those resources, all that money, all that everything. Build more fucking aircraft carriers. He okay. was very adamant about it from the very start. And he ended up being right. And that's exactly what the Navy did. And it had a humongous impact on World War II. Okay, so bearing in mind that he knows that the future of naval power is going to be all based off of carriers and planes, uh -huh. he goes and adopts a strategy that every American ship, it, we're, we're done. We're done with these like pretty observation decks and shit. If there's right. room on the deck, we're putting anti-aircraft guns. Every American ship is going to look like a fucking porcupine covered with 40 millimeter bofers and 20 millimeter orlicons. Okay, the only problem, he needs all of the guns. This dude uh -huh. sits down and does the math and figures out how many 20 millimeter orlicon, how many 40 millimeter bofers he needs to put on the decks of every ship in the U.S. Navy and puts in a purchase order for it and it gets kicked back because they're like, well, we're not going to put all these on the decks of the ships because, you know, we just don't think that we need that much. And Lee is like, <laughs> cool, didn't ask for permission to put them on the decks. I just asked to order the guns. To which they're... This man, this man is my favorite type of man. He will just get the job done. Consequences be damned. I, I absolutely love this. Like, he is... He is next level. Like, there are people that should aspire to be as efficient as this man is. Oh, my God. Like, shit, he has the authority to do that. And they stamped his thing approved and send it back to him, and he gets to order the guns. Then he whips out the old eraser because he filled out the last half of the work order and pen. And after it says, order guns, full stop, he erases the full stop and then writes down and install them on every ship in the Navy. <laughs> full stop. And then that's what he does. And then every time a ship comes back into port, it's just like an army of naval dudes come on and just put anti-aircraft guns on every 
everything everywhere. Then December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor happens. At this point, everything changes. Admiral Ernest King, like top dog at the Navy at this point, looks over to Lee. He's like, this guy gets shit done. I need somebody to make sure that the rest of the Navy is taking this seriously. So he promotes Lee to the Admiral of Fleet Readiness. And it is now Lee's job to make sure that the entire US Navy is like ready for war and treating this how they need to be treating this. Yeah. And Ching Lee's immediate concern is security because they're, they're way too lax. Okay, they're not even checking IDs. They're just letting people through, whatever. Right. I mean, the orders have changed. Like they've been told, hey, button this shit up. There's going to be spies coming, like whatever, but doesn't mean they're actually going to do it. So Lee's going to get to the bottom of that. First things first, remember, prankster at heart. He goes, gets a new military ID made, except this one has a picture of Hitler on it. He then proceeds to go and see how many maximum security naval institutions that he can get into with a U.S. Navy ID with a picture of fucking Hitler on it in World War II. And guess how many he gets into? No. All of them. Nobody stops him. Like, it's so ridiculous. He's like, I don't... I don't think I look like Hitler, do I? I mean, I guess we're both dudes. Uh, fuck it, we're just... <laughs> See, I have to worry about this. So I went to a uh, a, a sports store recently, right, to uh, to purchase my safe, right, and uh, <laughs> I, I I pulled aside an employee because I was like, "Hey, so I know you have this. Uh, I know this is in the back. Can we go take a look?" And the employee was just kind of confused, but also quite literally walked me into the back of the store. I mean, obviously, right? It, it's because they got the safe off of shipping. They got off it, but. I, I can firsthand tell you that sometimes all it takes is for you to be confident in what you're saying. And thankfully, obviously, Kip being me, I, I don't care for the extra BS. I wanted to get my safe. I wanted to get this safe. I wanted to be out. It still works to this day. And it you, ne you need to pay your security people more. Like, th th this could be fixed if they were compensated more, in my opinion. You will get so much through just confidence alone. It is absolutely unreal. I'm an internet idiot. Like, let, let's let's look at what I do. Right? I'm an internet idiot. <laughs> How far can I get just on confidence alone? <laughs> if you, if you, I feel like this story should have been told more. I get why I don't think it's told more. This this is comedic. This is bad. I have to get more ridiculous. So he gets another ID made with the famous female actress Mae West on it. And he's like, oh, well, I definitely don't look like her. Let's see how much shit I can get into now. And then he still gets into a bunch of places that he's not supposed Bro. to with this Mae West ID. So basically, he's chewing ass and getting everybody ready for the security level required for World War II with espionage and spies and all kinds of shit. Like, he's doing full-on ocean 11 type shit. He's got subordinates dressing up as butlers, going into fancy hotels, stealing top secret documents from top government officials, holding them until they get reported as stolen just to see how long it takes. All kinds of crazy shit. So this goes great and as a reward, Admiral King makes Lee the new commander of all of America's fast battleships. So now Lee's back in the game. He goes and immediately starts training the entire crew of the USS Washington in gunnery and night combat because he knows that the Japanese Navy has a big edge at night combat or at least they did before radar. Mm -hmm. He goes and then masters the radar to the degree that he's probably the most knowledgeable person on these radars in the US Navy, except mm -hmm. for the people that literally built them. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I ran out of time and I had to catch a flight, so we're finishing this video from Texas in my friend Eli's studio. Anyways, nice. back to the story. Not only is he training all of his guys in nighttime combat, he also has to basically go back through and retrain his entire gunnery department because he's not treating the USS Washington the same way every other battleship treats its guns. He's going through and treating each of the nine guns on the USS Washington like it's its own individual sniper rifle. It's so and while good. he's doing that, getting the guns more and more accurate, he comes to the realization that all the targeting data and the charts that came with the USS Washington from the manufacturer were wrong. They were off. They weren't accurate enough. So he goes to the Bureau of Ordnance again and is like, hey, your charts are wrong. To which the Bureau of Ordnance is like, no, they're not. You're wrong. <laughs> Except for the fact, obviously, Ching Lee doesn't miss. So he says, fuck it. And he redoes all of the charts and all of the targeting data himself. Over the course of the next couple months, he gets his crew and the guns on the USS Washington so accurate that he ends up having a light cruiser from his task force go 10 miles away. And then he fires the guns towards that ship and has the ship call in and say how close it was to the actual uh -huh. target. And he can walk these shells right up to the wake of this light cruiser without actually touching it. Literally like putting an app. That, that is wild. Like, oh my God. Man is truly just built. If you got the, I, I'm not good at accuracy. Don't get me wrong. I, I feel I can hit things. I feel I can do certain things, but it takes me a little bit to actually close it in, right? T you five, five, six, 200 yards. It takes me a few shots, but I can, I can hit target eventually, right? Like, 
that is just next level to zero in that quickly. This man is clearly knowledgeable and clearly skilled at what he does. I also do want to uh, commentate on uh, uh, other studio, Fat Electrician. The audio is is cl- it's close enough. I I do like this as somebody that does deal with audio, as somebody that has a person that I do ask with my about my audio, um, and a person who helped me get my audio to this point. Audio is such an important thing, and there are a lot of videos that I've reacted to of where just the audio doesn't miss or the audio you can tell it's different. I did want to give kudos that on a on you know on a not necessarily whim but just on short notice going to texas this is so close it's 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 perfect i did want to give fat electrician and the editor uh editing this props on that because that small detail alone can kill the flow of a video so good job guys excellent job on the editing pull on top of your head and letting your buddy shoot at it with a bow and arrow except he's doing <laughs> it with battleships so fast forward november 1942 the battle for guadalcanal is going on and the japanese navy is being sent to go bombard henderson field which mm-hmm. is an american airstrip that is instrumental to the war effort and they can't let it get destroyed so lee and his task force get sent in to go defend it. And right out of the gate, this entire thing is a shit show. They're sending in Lee in the USS Washington and the USS South Dakota, mm-hmm. the USS Washington sister ship. Now, the real problem, they're sending in four destroyers with them, but these destroyers were picked for the sole purpose of they were there and they were the ones with the most fuel. They had mm-hmm. never worked with Lee. They didn't know how he operated. They did not really know what was going on, but it just kind of happened. They all got lumped together and got sent out to go defend Henderson Field. So they're out there on patrol. They end up getting basically ambushed by a Japanese task force that opens fire on the dis- destroyers this task mm-hmm. force has managed to hug one of these smaller islands to avoid being detected by radar opened right. fire on the four destroyers ended up sinking three of them and critically damaging the third at which point they start opening fire on the uss south dakota at mm-hmm. which point ching lee sends a famous radio transmission stand aside i'm coming through this is Ching Lee. <laughs> now, the Japanese task force has a couple of destroyers. It also has the IJN Otago and the Takao, both of which are heavy cruisers. And they have their flagship, the IJN Kirishima, which was originally a battle cruiser. But in the 1930s, it got a bunch of upgrades in armor and firepower, having it reclassed as a battleship. This is mm. now a battleship versus battleship fight. The Japanese task force is continuing to target the South Dakota. Lee sneaks around the backside, clears the South Dakota, turns all nine of his guns and opens fire directly at their flagship, the Kirishima. And Uh with the first salvo, he hits. And then he keeps hitting. And he hits more. (laughs) And he's hitting the enemy so hard, so fast, so accurately, they don't even start returning fire. And within the span of five minutes, he manages to hit the Kirishima with 20 main battery hits and 24 hits from his secondary five-inch guns. Wow. Each one of those shells is 16 inches in diameter and weighs 1,700 pounds. Willis Ching Lee just bitch slapped the Kirishima with a goddamn (laughs) car dealership in five minutes. Okay, just so we're on the same page, the Kirishima is now been reclassified twice. The Japanese upgraded it and reclassified it from a battle cruiser to a battleship, and Ching Lee has now just downgraded it from a battleship to a fucking coral reef, and he did it in five minutes. <laughs> this is the last time in world history that a battleship sank another battleship in combat. Now, wow. at this point, the USS South Dakota has had so many electrical problems that the guns are down and the radio's down. Lee has no way to communicate with the South Dakota, but he can tell that it's trying to pull away from the fight and it's still getting attacked by the two Japanese heavy cruisers and the destroyers. So Lee, not knowing the status of the USS South Dakota, decides that he is the most able man in this fight and he needs to get all of their attention so that they can come fight him instead. So mm. he opens fire on the heavy cruisers, trying to get their attention, which he gets. He then proceeds to go the opposite direction as the USS South Dakota so that they quit chasing it down and they chase him instead. Mm-hmm. So they're chasing him down, but here's the problem. They're chasing him. They're behind him. He can't turn the ship around to no. shoot at him with the big guns without getting shot in return. And he doesn't uh-huh. want to get his boat shot shot up because this isn't a boat it's a goddamn precision instrument okay yeah. this is a giant fucking sniper rifle i don't want to be taking shots so he comes up with a better plan you see so i mean effectively he just did the handoff which is great he did the handoff to get it off of the uh the USS south dakota right to get them to follow him really like this this dude is just next level he's got that tactician in him like god this man just he, he does so much he is so much value as a single person in this setting. It's wild. He hasn't just been working on the gunnery skills of the nine 16 inch guns on the USS Washington. He's also been doing it on all of the five inch guns as well. And those turrets 
can still turn around and hit the enemy. And they are so accurate with their fire that Lee orders them to start targeting the searchlights on the other ships. And wow. they start blowing all the lights out <laughs> so they're not gonna be able to see the USS Washington at night. And then they start firing star clusters, which is just white phosphorus. The reason they do that is because remember the Japanese don't have radar. That's not how they're targeting the Washington. Uh -huh. All their targeting has to be done optically. So now oh no. the Japanese guys are smoke looking screen. at night and there's white phosphorus burning as it's floating through the sky and it's gonna fuck up all of their optics and they're not gonna be able to hit the USS Washington. So Ching Lee and the USS Washington do this and just lead the Japanese further and further away from the USS South Dakota until he's confident that they're gonna get away too. And then he just slips away into the night, virtually unscathed. He got hit a single time by a five inch gun, which is the equivalent wow. to a grown ass man getting hit with an airsoft gun. It's nothing. Yeah. For this, Admiral Lee would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross by Admiral Halsey. And when he received it, his crew demanded a speech. He turned around and simply said, and I quote, you want it, I'll wear it. Which yeah. is one of the coolest <laughs> things I've ever heard a military leader say ever. For the That's rest so of World cool. War II, it was honestly pretty quiet for the USS Washington. They were involved in some shore bombardments and they mostly just ran anti-aircraft operations for the aircraft carriers because it was a carrier-based war. Then by 1945, all of the Japanese battleships had been recommissioned into coral reefs and there just wasn't any reason to have all the fast battleships around anymore. So, they so he just said that this was a uh, battleship focused war, right? Does that mean that... <laughs> Willis Ching Lee was right all along in focusing on adding more guns to the decks and focusing into carriers and stuff. It's almost like you have the right people in the right positions and they, wow, they have the foresight to see how a new quote unquote meta will develop. Meta a term being, of course, us gamers, right? If you are, you know, playing something like Magic the Gathering or Yu-Gi-Oh, right? A certain deck becomes meta or for those of you that, you know, actually save money and don't play card games, I, I could have gotten to some hardcore stuff with if I didn't buy the amount of shiny cardboard I did, no joke. Or like new Call of Duty comes out, right? Oh, hey, shotguns are meta. Or go back to like what, Black Ops 3? Vesper, Cuda, that's meta, right? SMGs are pretty meta, right? Meta being something will always be more efficient at doing the thing, whether that's in a card game, making your board, making an unbreakable board, FTK, OTK, in a uh, video game. This just has the best time to kill. This has the best thing to do the job, to play the game as, right? The fact that he's able to see this, like, now carriers are going to be important. I, I like that he has the foresight to see this. He is the right person at the right time. You're exactly correct, Raven. They took Lee from the battleship and they wanted to use his talents elsewhere because now the biggest threat to the U.S. Navy was kamikazes and they wanted yeah. Ching Lee to be working on the anti-aircraft measures to help prevent this. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending because Aww. as he made his way back to America to begin working on those anti-aircraft measures, on August 25th, 1945, he would suffer a massive heart attack no. that would kill him in a matter of minutes. So in conclusion, that is a story of Willis Ching Lee. He is one of the most important people in naval warfare history and he gets no nowhere near the credit that he deserves. And I would argue that he is absolutely the greatest gunslinger of all time. The definition of a gunslinger is somebody that carries a gun and knows how to use it. And I don't think there's ever been anybody on the planet better at that than Willis Ching Lee. Not only does this man carry a gun and know how to use it, he has a gun that carries him and he knows how to use that one too. Capable of hitting a bullseye Amazing. with any caliber of gun from a pistol to the 16 inch guns on a battleship, this man could do it. So thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack, bang, out. Dude just understood his craft. He understood it well. Shit. <laughs> Eli doesn't have the same setup as me. I can't dramatically turn the lights off as I walk out. <laughs> Wasted. <laughs> what a good video. What a what a great video. What a one and great video. Two very very informative. Like I, I love this. This was absolutely great. Something that I think does need to be normalized more in React content on the internet. Uh, first of all, thank you, Fat Electrician. Thank you, uh, editor for Fat Electrician. I believe someone said his name was Fluck. You guys put absolutely amazing work out. I'm I'm very happy to watch your videos when I can. You know I. I love watching and reacting to them and uh, i hope that i'm you know respecting the content i know i do pause throughout and write out what commentary i can but uh you guys just put out awesome work i know you guys are working towards that uh, one mil mark finally i know you got two three million you. you guys are just going strong keep up the good work uh <laughs> two very very funny regarding the mp5 because discussion literally right before we started this stream right before we started this reaction so oddly interesting was looking at the uh, um 
uh, Brandon Herrera is variant, but I can't remember it offhand. But uh, no, very, very, very cool gun. And this is a story about just dude knew what he did. He had a specialty. He knew what he was doing and got held up by a bunch of that bureaucratic legal tape, which is rather unfortunate. You know, there are a lot of people that are incredibly talented. There are a lot of people that uh, maybe their talents are misunderstood. That actually starts getting into uh, standardized education, why there are issues with certain standardized education protocols and procedures. That is above my pay grade really to really discuss. Teachers can actually enlighten you a lot more than I can. This was an amazing video, though. If you have not checked out The Fat Electrician, go ahead and check out The Fat Electrician. He is an awesome person, continues to put out great work, and you know, I, I give these a little bit of time before I do react to them, just out of courtesy. I want to make sure that this has time to sit in the algorithm first, but uh, this was an absolute treat to watch, and you know, part of why I do what I do. I learn new things every single day. I had no idea who Willis Ching Lee was before this. And now I have an absolutely just amazing video to reference when people ask, well, you know, where are you getting this information? What do you like? Hey, so Fat Electrician has this video. You should definitely watch this. That was nothing short of amazing. One thing that I did want to uh, talk about really quick while I was here at the end of this, and this is, you know, something that's rather, uh, I guess, synonymous <laughs> with fat electrician uh i did go to the uh, the shields that opened up here recently in uh, idaho i drove out to it uh this was day one uh this was the opening day saturday the 6th of uh, april 2024 i honestly thought it was great they had a diver in the tank two stories of just absolute just insanity i loved it i thought that this was really super cool and you know what i never would have uh thought to go to shields until fat electrician uh, told me about it so i do want to go on the record that marketing works uh shields if you have a person who's watching this or watching fat electrician um it, it worked i i assure you i uh, in fact got a a vault pelican case which uh and also this i, I i'm tired of using like the two dollar range glasses so i actually went and got myself some uh three lens system i got i got this it's super cool i uh, went to shields and bought some stuff <laughs> I thought it was an absolutely really, really enjoyable experience. If you have not had a chance to go out to Shields, I do absolutely recommend it. If you are in the Idaho area, I can tell you this one that I did travel to, not doxing my own area. Uh, this one is out in uh, Meridian, Idaho, off the freeway. Um, very, very cool location. It's got a big Ferris wheel inside. It's got a cafe. It's it, it, it's very interesting. If you have not gone out to it, uh, definitely treat yourself. It is quite an interesting experience. Um, and then I guess I'll finish off with... Uh, <laughs> I got some more goodies. This was not from Shields. Uh, I did get uh, some new range kit. I don't know what happened to my pink set of this, but uh, I got new range gear. I got new headgear. Uh, some Beretta mags. Oh, Beretta mags are expensive, though. I didn't know how expensive they were. And obviously, we have the safe. Ignore <laughs> ignore the 38 special up here. That is uh, from my buddy. He, he he loves his 38 special and uh, definitely missed his birthday. So I figured I'd get him a little uh, fun pack of 250. <laughs> but that is my safe. It is a very good safe. I like it. I think it's super cool. And uh, this might be a, uh, what, what do we call it? going to call this a foreshadowing of things to come potentially wink, wink, <laughs> but alas, fat electrician, awesome creator. If, uh, if you have not uh, looked them up, definitely go look them up. I know there are people that have found fat electrician through me. Awesome creator. Thank you for allowing me this time to, uh, you know, do a little personal thing with that and uh, have yourselves a wonderful rest of your day.